So over a year ago, I posted a tool-assisted speedrun of Polybridge 2, being the first world in just under 90 seconds. At the time, it was the fastest anyone has ever seen the first world ever be beaten. However, people soon realized that there was a lot more that could be done to improve it. I'm Arglin, and today I'll be showing you how we shattered this tool-assisted world record. Just a day after the Tool Assisted Speedrun was released, several people had started planning and found strategies for levels that would help beat the game even faster. The first came from Celestial for 116, which allows the level simulation to complete 2 seconds faster. The strategy involves the same bridge setup, however, now it also included an additional falling road that would give the bus a sudden speed boost to get to the end significantly faster. This would be the only significant time save for months that would follow it. At the time, I had wondered if there was a faster way to beat 1-3 and 1-9, as they had the slowest vehicles. However, there weren't many ideas as to what could be done. Falling Road was not a viable strategy, not even as a speed boost, despite several attempts being made. Other glitches at the time also could not be performed on either the dump truck or the bulldozer. It wouldn't be until the 30th of June 2021 when a strat modification could be found. On 1-12, the existing strategy had been to perform a glitch known as a torque cannon. This glitch would push a road down on the front of the limo, sending it flying. However, the strategy at the time would make the limo land on the rock losing almost all of its speed. Learning from 1-16, a faster route is to use a straight bridge instead, allowing the simulation to finish 2 seconds faster. These would be the only two modifications left which would not trigger the game's cheat system. An additional discovery was made on October 20th, where keeping the camera in its default position in both build and simulation mode skips the camera's transitioning time and starts the simulation immediately. Though this was only a small thing that didn't affect existing runs too much. Only two months after 1-12's strategy modification, however, a new discovery was made that would revolutionize Polybridge 2 speedrunning forever. On the 27th of August 2021, a new glitch was discovered by Minecat. The initial procedure that was used to perform the glitch was long and tedious. However, it would quickly be optimized over time to the current strategy we use today. First, you place down the material of your choice. Then, you right-click to select the joint that you want to move. You would then momentarily hold down the left shift key followed by holding down the left click on the joint to switch to dragging mode. After that, you would hit delete on your keyboard. This would delete the joint, but not cancel the dragging operation. And finally, you would drag your cursor to the new desired point, escape, and then undo. Material could finally now be stretched. The first utilization of this glitch in speedrunning would be demonstrated by Minecat on the same day. Only the day after, more strategies would be found, and if long materials on their own had not already cut the time down significantly enough on their own, a secondary discovery would be made that would allow people to beat levels even faster. On 6-12, it was discovered that this glitch allowed you to ignore the collision of vehicles altogether when building, allowing you to get roads stuck inside of the vehicles. And on 1-2, immediately following, it was found that this would allow you to launch vehicles at ludicrous speeds, far faster than ever before. As a comparison, a friend and active modder of Polybridge 2, Conquered, created a program that could track building and simulation times for the game. Here's how long it takes for 1-2 to complete using three different methods. Using the original method, using Falling Road, 
and use it. Because of this, the glitch took a new name, SLR, short for Stuck Long Road. It wouldn't take long until we get a flood of new solutions. Side note, this glitch actually shook the Polybridge 2 speedrunning scene so much that a new category was made to try and keep the old style still viable for speedrunning as the methods required drastically different strategies. This is why if you visit the game's page on speedrun.com, you will now see the categories are called 80%, 80% NMA, which is short for No Major Abuses, and 100% NMA. Over time, more strategies were used, which didn't involve the use of the road gang stuck in a vehicle, and thus the entire category was named to illegal length materials. Despite all these discoveries, however, development on a new tool assisted speedrun would not occur until the month following, starting with 1-5. Then, on the 19th of October, an unusual strategy was being developed for 1-11 by Fathom. It uses SLR, however, you may notice that one of the roads is long, quite, quite long. It was, at the time, pretty laughable, though people wouldn't be laughing for long. There would be two new strategies proposed the following day. The first was proposed by Christian Akpro, one of the developers of the game. It hadn't been thought of before, but it was entirely possible to interact with the game even outside of its boundaries. And so I immediately adopted this strategy for Fathom's 1-11 method. This wasn't without some controversy, though it was more or less an accepted strategy and was named... Uh... Actually, it has two names. One is Here Be Dragons, or Dragon Percent, a reference to the same phrase that would be used on old maps referring to unexplored or dangerous territories. It was proposed in case the strategy would become significant enough to be used in tournaments or larger speedrunning creators. However, the main name that it goes by nowadays is the most direct name most people could think of, the Building Out of Bounds strategy, or in short, Boobs. For obvious reasons, naming it this had some rather great implications. Anywho, enough talk about boobs, let's talk about the second strategy that was proposed that day. It doesn't have a formal name, though I usually call it the exit re-enter strategy. At the time, speedrunners would wait for the level complete screen to appear and hit next level to proceed. However, this takes several seconds before it appears. My proposed strategy would be that if all parameters were satisfied, such that a level complete screen would appear, you could leave to the level selection screen and enter the next level without having to wait. It wouldn't be until 4 days later though when I actually decided to prove its viability in regular speedrunning. However, for regular speedrunning, this did run into both logistical problems and moral problems. So it was pretty quickly ruled out as a viable strategy for regular speedrunning. For a bit, it was considered viable for tool-assisted speedruns, but a day later, it would be met with more controversy. To this day, the controversy has not been fully resolved, though Conquer did bring up a different speedrunning controversy, which has a very similar story. Summarize, a strategy used in Wii Sports speedrunning utilizes resetting the game after completing the last hole in golf. An additional rule was added if a chip-in is performed on the last hole, which is when a golf ball hits the flag and lands in the hole. This rule was that you had to see the text chip-in appear before you could exit. Sound familiar? The reason that this rule was added was to prevent cases where chip-ins wouldn't actually count as a completion as the ball had a chance of bouncing back out. However, a run submitted by Paul in the mall had a chip-in such that it guaranteed that the ball would go in no matter what. This was eventually accepted as a valid speedrun despite breaking the original rule. So, I chose to follow suit. Or well, I should say, we chose to follow suit, as soon 
I wouldn't be alone on creating a tool assisted speed run. Back in October, I proposed a thought. At the time, we could only use third party programs to produce tool assisted speedruns of the game. However, this had issues with lag and the lack of being able to have precise inputs. It would be really nice if we could do that. Hey there, I'm Concord. I've been responsible for developing one of the critical parts to any tool assisted speedrun the tools. Polybridge 2 presented us with some pretty difficult challenges. The nature of the game is very different to that of other games, and as such, there was no out-of-the-box tooling that could be used. The sandbox experience that the game provides starkly contrasts the real-time nature of most video games. With this sandbox environment comes unique challenges relating to recording the actual TAS inputs. Developing optimised strategies for the TAS is crucial. With the sheer volume of different tweaks to bridges we cycle through, it is important that the process is as streamlined as possible. Our tooling provides utilities to temporarily disable vehicle hitboxes, so that ILMs can be performed like building a normal bridge. It also includes the groundwork to capture exact positions of bridge nodes, spring sliders, and other useful information. This can be captured either relative to the sandbox grid, or to the pixels on your screen. In our tooling, runs are actual programs. This allows them to execute complex logic and directly hook into game events. The game can be recorded fairly easily, however, there are some unwanted side effects. My computer isn't capable of recording the run in real time, so I had to slow the game's update cycle down. However, Animations and transitions are tied to the real time instead of the update cycle, meaning they play back faster than they should be in the final recording. So I had to make sure to actively suppress this behaviour and correct it in order to provide an accurate time. This lack of real time recording also breaks the audio system. Consequently, the only sound effects present in the final run are the UI sounds, which are logged and then can be added to the video file later. Now, we need to address the most controversial strategy used in the run, the building out of bounds strategy. Arglin has already discussed the issues with using this glitch in ordinary speedruns, so I would like to focus on how the glitch will actually be performed in the TAS. In the typical method of performing the building out of bounds strategy, you need to be able to click beyond the camera boundaries of the game. This then allows you to begin clicking inside the window and release the click when your mouse is positioned outside of it, causing the game to register the end of the mouse input at the out of bounds position. However, there's a problem with this. Some of the positions that we want to be able to move materials to are incredibly far from the actual window position. This gives us two options. Option A is to make the window very small, and option B is for you to have a high resolution display. Neither of these options are convenient. But this is a task. We only need to show the theoretical behaviour of such a glitch. On Windows, you cannot move the mouse cursor outside the bounds of your monitor, but you can move the game window. To perform the glitch, the TAS moves the game window in the opposite direction of the specified out of bounds mouse position, such that the game registers it in the desired place. For the sake of viewing pleasure, the recording will always remain focused on only the game window. In order to perform the build out of bound glitches used in our run, you would require two 8K displays next to each other. However, our software solution bypasses this and allows you to emulate the behaviour without the monitors. Exiting and re-entering a level can be done faster using a hybrid of mouse and keyboard input. A lot of game panels, such as the pause menu, begin processing inputs from the keyboard and partially from the mouse before they are fully visible. This saves a few frames on the most wasteful part of the run, waiting for animations when transitioning between levels. Another useful quirk is the scroll sensitivity. When it is set to its maximum value, it zooms the camera out very far from just one frame of scrolling. It is, however, favourable to avoid zooming out wherever possible, as you must consequentially reset the camera before starting the simulation. And with all this, we were finally able to create the modern tool assisted speedrun. Here's a breakdown of all the strategies. First, the generic ones. 1-16 had the simplest strategy, place down two roads, 
and then perform SLR on the bus to launch it. 1-1 and 1-2 use similar strategies. Place down two or three roads, then perform boob strats to make the rows absurdly long. 1-13 Place down two roads and perform SLR on one of them. 1-8, 1-9, 1-12, and 1-14 perform SLR to get the roads vertically through the vehicle. Lastly, 1-3 and 1-4 use similar strategies. Stack a lot of roads, then perform SLR to get the roads through the vehicle. And now for the more interesting ones. 1-11, as I had shown before, uses the boob strategy to launch the van. The van then bumps into the compact car, launching it with it. A road is put on the top to prevent the van from overshooting the checkpoint. 1-6 uses the original strategy in the first task, which is a hydraulic cannon. A hydraulic cannon forces a road into the Vespa, allowing for it to be pinched into the ground and then launched. The new strategy modifies this such that the road starts already partially inside the Vespa, allowing for the launch to begin almost instantaneously. 1-10 uses an ILM to stretch springs extremely far, allowing what was effectively a spring cannon on steroids. 1-15 is a bit crazy. One dash five is also a bit crazy. It uses a similar launch to one dash two for the van, along with some additional rows to help guide it. On a sports car, you also perform an SLR. However, it often launches the car into the sky, so additional roads were placed to stop it from overshooting the flag. And lastly, one dash seven uses perhaps the most interesting strategy of all the levels so far. The original strategy was to perform an SLR, which would launch the taxi at the checkpoint. Then you would perform another glitch exploit called the Flip Cannon, which would take advantage of the vehicle hitbox, once flipped, to kick the taxi back to the goal. However, I felt like this was rather slow, despite the fact that this is pretty much about as optimized as it could get. There's an unavoidable delay with the reverse checkpoint, and there's not much you can do about it with the current strategy. So. I came up with a new strategy. Perform an SLR in the taxi and send it flying much higher over the checkpoint. Then, build a swing to channel the momentum of the taxi going forwards into going back faster. And so that is every level in World 1 made up to date. Now, before I show you the completed run, I wanted to mention one more thing. And it's something I didn't want to mention at the beginning. At the end of the old tool assisted speedrun, I decided just for the giggles, I would show a spliced run with 2400% speed. However, another person had taken that section more seriously, and that was Unis. He ended up posting a run, which spliced together his best runs using a modded version of the game. Ever since, Concord and I had wondered if it would be even remotely possible to beat this legitimately. Even with the exit re enter strategy, that left us with only about 10 seconds to beat all the levels, nearly 10 times faster than my previous attempt. So, sadly, this would be a distant dream. Or so we thought. So yeah, that's pretty much what's happened in the past year for Twisted Speedrunning. A lot of stuff has happened, and we hope to see whether or not more stuff will be discovered. But until then, my name is Arglin, your local Durgo Poly engineer, and have a wonderful day. Love y'all. Bye bye. And last, wow, Jesus, I'm hungry. <laughs> Anywho, enough talk about boobs. Let's talk about dick.